Okay. Welcome everyone to our July 27th meeting. How are y'all doing? Um, today we have Jacqueline Buzzy speaking. She's a Florida certified uh, mediator. She's also certified by the federal court and by the bankruptcy court for mortgage modification. Um, she started her modification business in 2007 and she's been an attorney since 1999. In 2008, she uh, joined the Collier County uh, Foreclosure Task Force, which she'll, she'll speak about. And just as a side note, she's also a publisher of children's books, which deal with lawyers. So it's just a side note there. So I'll go ahead and turn the floor over to her. And we do have flyers here at the front um, detailing uh, what's going to be spoken about today. Thank you. Hello, thank you. I, um, I'm glad I had an opportunity to get around to say hi to everybody today. Um, by show of hands, can you tell me how many people in here do debtors work? And then any creditors on the creditor side? You do a little bit of both. Okay. Um, well, good. Then I know who I'm speaking to. I know my crowd. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, the trails that were blazed um, that left the path highly praised. And the path that's highly praised is the one that was put in place uh, through the Middle District of Florida, through our wonderful judiciary. Um, and it's um, working very well and adopted nationally by uh, most states now. If I go into topics that you already know, because I'm going to take us back through the uh, tumultuous years of the foreclosure crisis and the impending doom. Okay, now wait, we've got to go back. Okay, um, and so back when we go back to 2006 time frame, 2007 time frame, for anybody practicing law in the state of Florida back then, and the circuit civil courts particularly, you know that we were one of the most overburdened judicial systems in the country. Our judges at that time, their caseloads were uh, about 49% greater than the national average. And I remember going to inns of court meetings in Collier County and having Judge Brousseau at every meeting say, the wheels are off. The wheels are off. It's not a matter of when, it's a matter of now. We can't deal with the caseload that we have. Um, then we had Article 5, Revision 7. And if you all remember what that was about, that was about uh, redistributing the, the funds for the state system so we had a more unified court system. Um, in Collier County specifically, we were one of the counties that had a great deal of funds. We lost um, our juvenile drug court program and our teen court program. We lost hearing officers for our traffic courts. And in response to what was happening throughout the state with the uh, redistribution of funds, well, of course, I have to also say that other counties gained things that they didn't have, basic necessities that they didn't have. Uh, but what the, what the clerks of court did around the state was raise filing fees. And one of the filing fees they raised at the time was foreclosure filing fees. And I put the amounts there. The foreclosure filing fee in Collier County went up to $1,900. And if you were filing a counterclaim, you were going to pay $900. Wrong direction. Okay. Um, at that time, foreclosures were about less than 1% of the filings in the, our court system. There were about 70,000 filings per year. Um, and if you, were, if you did any during that time, they were so simplistic. They were summary proceedings that were usually never contested. There were no disputed facts or issues of law, and so it was a summary judgment that would usually be entered, and the entire process would take nine months to complete. But then we had a tsunami, and when the tsunami came at its height, it pushed 400,000 per year filings into our court system that was already overburdened before it hit. There were, by 2013, there were 300,000 cases backlogged in our circuit courts throughout the state. And these cases did have complex legal issues. There were standing issues, there were lost note issues, there were fraud issues, um, and there was a lot of scams going on at the time. If you remember, borrowers who were going into default were getting contacted by people claiming that they were the bank and all they needed to do was send money and people were sending money and it was a mess. But in every event, these cases were quite complex and um, the information from, uh, that I found from 2014 said it took an average of 2.5 years to complete and I think that the probably if we look back now at the average, it's probably going to be a much longer average than that. Of course, in Lee County we had a rocket docket and that was kind of controversial. So 
So far, have I said anything to anybody that they didn't know before or that, um, that they were unaware of at the time? No. So we all lived through it. We know what the nightmare was. Okay. Um, and so there were efforts uh, being undertaken at the local level and at the state level already starting in 2008 in Collier County. We, we formed the Collier County Foreclosure Task Force. And that was a grassroots initiative that began with the Collier County Bar Association and Legal Aid Association of Collier County. Um, it was done in anticipation of what was yet to come. Uh, we didn't really know at that time. Things were just starting to go into default. Things were just starting to hit the courts. Uh, but at that point in time, we were trying to be proactive and make determinations on a community-wide basis of what services would be needed by people facing foreclosure and how we could help. Um, right after that, the federal government adopted the federal program Making Homes Affordable, which, which went into um, effect in 2009. They introduced programs like HAMP and HARP, and the HAMP uh, program established guidelines for mortgage modification. Um, and basically they set up what they call a waterfall, so if you're doing mortgages now, even if we're in non-HAMP, you're going to hear those terms used, so you should be familiar with them. But the waterfall was basically that they had to take you down to a 31% gross monthly uh, mortgage payment that was equal to 31% of your gross monthly income with principal and interest taxes and insurance. And how they got there was they would reduce their interest rate, they could extend the term out to 40 years, and they could reduce principal, but they never did. Uh, rarely, if ever. I think I've seen one case where that happened. Um, and the, how the waterfall works is that if they're going through the waterfall process, the interest rate could drop down to 2%, but if they got you into the spectrum at 4%, that's where they stopped the waterfall, they adjusted you to a 4% interest rate, and they modified the mortgage. The other programs that followed were HAFA, which was a short sale program offered through the federal government, a cash for keys program uh, that they offered because a lot of the homes were not being left in good condition and they wanted to have incentive for borrowers uh, who needed help moving um, to leave the home in good repair. And then hardest hit funds and the first county to receive hardest hit funds was Lee County and that's nationally. Um, then there was the introduction of a statewide task force that was created in March of 2009 because by that time we did have uh, foreclosures hitting the courts pretty hard. I think I skipped the slide. This. Oh, the creation of it, there's printed on both sides for those of you who are following on the um, outline, I didn't notice. Okay, um, and so when they created the statewide task, task force that happened March 27, 2009, they adopted a, ultimately adopted an administrative order um, which basically set forth a mass mediation protocol that was to be used in all uh, state courts throughout the state. And it relied on a large facility or a large group or center to take over the mediation cases and basically serve as an overflow valve for all of those cases. So we became case managers, basically. And the people who stepped forward, I don't know if you recall at the time, but there were programs put on by the American Arbitration Association, the Collins Center for Public Policy, the Conant Mediation Group, um, OASIS, and uh, Firestone. Those were the big ones that I can remember, and there may have been others as well. And they were largely unsuccessful. Uh, basically, um, they all had different requirements and protocols. Uh, in every instance, they were required to connect with, connect with the borrower, and in many instances, the borrower's contact information was not accurate. There were few borrowers that were ever reached, um, and those that were made it actually came and showed up at the mediation. Um, people were very leery of anything that they didn't understand, and borrowers assumed, I think, in many instances, this was part of a scam as well. Um, banks did not have loss mitigation departments. So for those of you who were working through this frustrating period of time, whether you were on the servicer side or on the uh, borrower side, um, we were resubmitting documents over and over and over. They would have a central fax because that's how things were going back then. And 
we'd uh, get together at mediation and the banks would say, we never received your packet. And people would have evidence that they've submitted that packet five times, six times, seven times, and there we are doing document exchange at mediation. Um, borrowers failed to attend mandatory counseling um, in many jurisdictions, not necessarily here. A mandatory counseling was part of the program. They had to attend that before they came to mediation. And one complicating factor for the mediators in the process was there was um, complicated reporting requirements and how that flowed since we were all independent contractors working for a mediation center and um, also how mediators were paid was um, a little frustrating for many. Um, and because of its dismal failure, the courts, uh, there was ultimately an order that came out giving uh, circuits an option to proceed or not, and that came through in 2011. Meanwhile, in the federal courts, all of those cases that were getting modified on trial modification that um, ultimately turned out that they were denied modification at the end of the day, those were flowing into the bankruptcy courts. And they were stalling the, the caseload for the bankruptcy judges because inevitably you all were showing up in court saying, hey, my client's in a trial mod. We think he's going to get permanently modified, and we need to wait until they have a decision rendered. Um, and so the Chapter 13 judges out of the Middle District of Florida put together a panel in 2010. Um, it consisted of mediators, attorneys, bank representatives, and underwriters, um, and they came up with a concept or an idea that they thought would work for everybody that would help them move these cases along so they wouldn't get bogged down. They originally launched MMM in the Middle District of Florida, the first um, area in the country to launch it in a federal program, and it had such great success. Um, in the very early days, Orlando was showing success rates of 70 to 80 percent modified. Um, because of the success, it, ex it was adopted in Tampa and Jacksonville the following year, and then it ultimately spread down into the Southern District, which is a little different program. They have an LMM program down there, but that began in 2013, and the Northern District began their program in 2013. Oh, I went the wrong way again. Okay, so here we go. Um, there was a statewide summit held in 2014 um, talking about the issues that were coming up in these processes and seeing if they could iron out the issues. Um, that happened in February 27. There were 145 attendees and many were turned away and most of them that were turned away were servicers because we had a lot of servicers at the summit. Uh, but there wasn't space for everybody who wanted to participate. There were 11 judges, uh, chapter 13 trustees, clerks of courts from all districts um, in the state of Florida. Uh, there were also major lenders and service providers from across the country, including Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, Bank of America. All of the big players had a seat at the table and everyone had a voice. Um, they identified um, and addressed all of the issues, and one of the biggest issues that the servicers had was that they really wanted to modify these mortgages and make a non-performing uh, bad debt turn into a performing mortgage. But every uh, state and every district and every jurisdiction that ad adopted a model had different requirements for their program. So they didn't have a way to effectively train their personnel to participate in these mortgage modification mediations. So one of the things that they insisted on was they needed to have uniformity across 97 federal districts for anybody that was coming in. Um, they also said that uh, they needed to be able to create, as I said, one training that worked for everybody. Um, and they were very happy with the results that came out of that summit. So shortly after that, they did the National Settlement Judicial, uh, Judicial Convention where the program was introduced nationally. So, I have that. Part of this program to create uniformity was the introduction of a uniform district-wide MMM, which is mortgage modification, if I'm using that word and you're not familiar with it, uh, portal system. We have a portal administrator, which is at uh, Default Mitigation Management, LLC. <clears throat> Their contact information and website information I've provided in the materials. You can contact them directly to set yourself up in the portal. 
Um, or you can go through the, uh, just their general um, info at or support at defaultmitigation.com. And it's very easy to do, but it does take a little bit of time. Um, from the servicer's perspective, I'm not sure how long it takes because one of the things the servicer has to do is it has to upload and provide all of their uh, lender-specific information and documents and forms that they need filled out for modification under their programs. The system is uh, very user-friendly and pretty easy to use once you've uh, been exposed to it. And it does provide a secure document management system, which means that when we get to mediation, we don't have a whole lot of, we didn't get the documents, or we don't know what you're talking about, or that wasn't provided, because we have it right there to review. And it is confidential and secure. Um, mediation basically begins the minute somebody uploads something in the portal. So we've deemed that all of those portal communications are part of a uh, facilitated mediation and it's monitored by the mediator. That's part of our obligation. Um, as we are going along with a system that seems to be working pretty well for everybody, we still had issues coming out of the Middle District of Florida specifically, which is where I've done the majority of my work in 2014 and 2015. We did not have uniformity between our court orders. We had mandates in Orlando that were different from mandates in Fort Myers that were different from mandates in Tampa and Jacksonville. and. Um, it, it proved to be challenging for everybody who was providing services, particularly if you're a servicer and you have your client in all of those courts at once and you're not sure how many days you had to do X, Y, or Z when they're all different. Um, they differed in many ways. One of the differing things was mediator qualifications. In uh, Orlando, you had to be an attorney to be a mediator in federal court, um, even on a mortgage modification program. But in Fort Myers, you did not have to be an attorney. And um, I believe that the, the greater weight has settled on you don't have to be an attorney. So a lot of the mediators who are on the mortgage modification mediation rotation list are um, non-lawyers. Uh, the filing of reports for mediators was different in different jurisdictions. Some had, we had to file in five days, some had, we had to file in seven, but those were issues for mediators, not necessarily the parties. The use of telephonic appearances, which is kind of standard operating procedure, um, in some jurisdictions were not allowed unless the mediator gave you express permission, um, and how those telephonic appearances uh, had to be made or could be made were different. Um, the amount the mediator was getting paid was different. Um, we still have uh, a little bit of a difference, but at least it's resolved in the Middle District of Florida. Uh, they're paid, mediators are paid more for the same work in the Southern District and in the Northern District, but you know, I don't think anybody has an issue with that who's mediating right now. Um, the other issue which created the biggest can of worms for everybody is the mediation in good faith. And so, has everybody heard about mediating in good faith? Anybody have that conversation or concern? Or, Well, if you go back historically, uh, since the beginning of ADR throughout Florida, there was never a good faith requirement for mediation. And um, there is an assumption in law that we as lawyers are always going to act in good faith. But you could use the mediation process, and you can, and I think good litigators do, for any purpose. And a lot of instances when you go to mediation, if you're going to mediation early, it's a discovery adventure. Because even though what they're saying to you in the context of mediation is strictly confidential, that doesn't mean that you can't pump out a, a, you know, a discovery, a request for production based on something you heard at a mediation. And that's largely how they were used. Um, not exclusively, of course, people do want to settle and you do mediate to keep the costs and fees down, but there are many reasons why. The other thing is you want to test the, the quality of their witnesses. If the party is sitting at the table and you know that's the person who's going to be taking the stand against your client, you kind of want to get a feel for are they going to be a good witness? Are they articulate? Are they intelligent? Are they well-groomed? Um, these things you can discover in a mediation context, and does that mean that you're mediating in bad faith? I don't think so. But in every event, it doesn't seem to be a judgment that a mediator should be making. Um, and in some jurisdictions, the court entered an order that said we must report conduct that fell below good faith. 
So who wants to meet with a mediator who's going to do that? Um, the mediation uh, ADR sections got very involved when the specifically Southern District of Florida is one that still has that mandate, that mediator report, lack of good faith. Um, and there are many things that it seems to conflict with. It conflicts with um, violations of impartiality and confidentiality that are set forth in Florida Statutes 4.44.405. Well, you may say we're in federal court. Why would state law apply? It applies because it applies to my certification as a mediator and I am bound by Florida statutes, and I believe that in most of the court proceedings um, and orders that they've issued, it does say will be governed by those rules of the Florida statutes, um, also because it provides us with um, uh, protection, um, as a court would have, uh, for our uh, services. It also is unethical uh, for mediators to report bad faith under a mediator rule 10.520. So these issues ended up in the hands of um, the uh, Mediator Ethics uh, Commission seeking an advisory opinion, and a couple were written. Um, so, oh yeah, okay. Um, and so uh, the good faith in mediation, as I said, uh, also we had issues and um, mandates in. Uh, the Florida rules for certified and court appoint appointed mediators are at 10.300, which requires that a mediator um, ensure that everything is uh, based on the consent of the parties um, and that we protect and preserve a party's right to self-determination, that we remain impartial, that we preserve and protect confidentiality, and that we avoid improper influence or coercion. Um, and so MEAC, uh, the Mediator Ethics um, Association uh, Committee, came out with an ethics opinion for mediators, which is MEAC 2012-005, that basically said if, we're, if we find ourselves in a situation where we're being told we have to report something that we know by law we cannot report, we must withdraw. That just means that anybody doing those mediations is an unethical mediator, and ethical mediators can't do them, which is kind of nonsensical. Uh, so it became um, a further discussion was warranted on the topic, and the ABA ADR section came out with an opinion that basically said, look, we agree sanctions should be imposed on people who are, um, if they're doing something that is an objectively determinable conduct that falls below, good faith. So court, if you want us to report that, give us the list of what that would be and we can know with specificity without exercising our own individual judgment on a subjective matter, um, we would be happy to work within your guidelines. The other thing they said is just lose the, lose the words good faith. And there's a lot of arguments why we should because as I said before, it's implied in everything we do. Um, in some instances, it's expressed, but certainly not in this context and not where we would have to report um, conduct. So in response to all of the concerns that came out and the flurry of discussion and opinions coming out of um, the courts and out of the um, ethics groups, uh, the Middle District of Florida amended their rules, 9019-2K, uh, uh, um, which became effective July 1, 2014, and they changed their language, and it just says the parties are, quote, encouraged to participate, quote, uh, in a good faith attempt to resolve issues between them, and there is no mandatory reporting requirement put on the mediator uh, anymore, except in the Southern District. So we have another opinion from the MEAC, which came out 2014-010, that says in the Southern District, if we're mediating, we must state in our opening statement that we have an obligation under the court order to report bad faith conduct. So under that scenario, the Ethics commi um, Committee has said uh, we are bound to, as a mediator, to follow the mandates of a court order and a rule as long as they're not uh, asking us to violate law, and they said that this would be an acceptable way to alert the attorneys that we do have that obligation and to ensure that we're complying with our mediator ethics. Um, and I don't really 
I haven't done anything in the Southern District in the federal courts. I've done things um, uh, outside in the state courts. So I haven't been put in that position yet, but I, I don't envy being put in that position. We also have, as I told you before, Florida Statutes 44.405, which is the Mediation Confidentiality and Privilege Act for Florida. It requires or permits mediators, and just so you know, in some instances we're mandatory reporters, um, that we must report or can report with the consent of parties. We can also report um, plans or must report plans or uh, attempts to conceal a criminal conduct. Any abuse, child abuse, elder abuse, spousal abuse, we're mandatory reporters. Anything offered in a professional malpractice case, so if we are called to testify, we can disclose what you've said at a mediation. Uh, we can also be called to refute, amend, um, void a settlement agreement if we're called to do so in court. And we can report professional misconduct to an investigating body, i.e. the Florida Bar. We're all mandatory reporters, we know that. The Florida Bar has the same rule of ethics on lawyers as they do on mediators. Um, now we have MMM happening in the bankruptcy proceedings. We have the secure portal, we're all using it, it's working, people are happy, we have very little problems, we're having a lot of success rate. But um, what happened is, where is my, um, it looks like a something here. We have, uh, HAMP is leaving us. The application for deadline, if you were looking for a HAMP modification, which was that professional, um, the, the federal mortgage modification where we're going through the waterfall, the application deadline was December 3rd, 2016. So if you didn't have your client in the portal system by then, you weren't going to get a HAMP mod anymore. It's gone. The modification deadline, if you do have one in the portal system that's being considered for HAMP, they've got to get you modified by September 30, 2017, or it's gone. Um, but most banks and servicers who are in the portal system who've been working with us have said they want to continue to modify. They're offering in-house modifications. Well. What does that mean? And I guess that's the big question. Um, there's, they say they're loosely following HAMP guidelines, but they don't tell you how or what that is. They're telling you that uh, they have their own protocols and program parameters. Everybody's are different, but they're not going to tell you what that is. They're, as I said, less transparent. Um, a lot of it they're saying is proprietary in nature and it's not going to be shared. They're not nearly as flexible as they were under HAMP. I know that HAMP gave them some incentives um, to work with borrowers, but when the incentive is taken away, I don't know how um, interested they are in still modifying. They say they are. We're still modifying, just so you know we're having success. But I'm also seeing a few more denials than I had in the past. Um, and we have new people in the mix, and I think for everybody who's coming in and doing this now, that's one of the biggest frustrations, because if you've been doing this for a long time, we had a really nice boat that flowed pretty easily through the shores, and it was not rough seas, and everybody knew what they were doing, they knew their role, they knew the parameters. Now we have people coming in who are clueless. I don't think some of the people even know and understand that we have rules that govern the proceedings. And so I have to remind them that on the opening statement, we have people who think they're going to email outside the portal system and start change of, chains of communication on other things that we're going to look at and review. And I have to remind them that the court order says all communications must be in the portal. Um, they don't understand how they're complicating a process that shouldn't be complicated. I think another thing that's sort of happening is we all had to remember that mediation at every level is a voluntary process. We don't force people to settle at mediation. Nobody has to. And um, the banks want to. And I think sometimes that message doesn't trickle down to some of the people who are zealously representing um, banks or servicers in this process of mediation. And we have our advocate hat on when we sit down at the table. Um, the reason the banks are there is because they help create this program and they want to be there. It should not be an opportunity to do a gotcha, missed a deadline, now we're going to say you're denied. 
Um, there are a lot of servicers that don't do that, that work with you, but we do have new people in the process. Um, and so uh, that is a frustration. They also don't realize that they were supposed to upload their own documents. We have new banks coming in, not the big servicers anymore. We have all kinds of little private banks now. We have private lenders. We have person-to-person -person loans that are getting modified through this process. Um, and we still have to go by the same rules. So it's a challenge, I think, herding kittens, getting them all back trained on this is how we do it. Um, but hopefully we'll get there and we'll continue to have success. Um, there was a new, for those of you who are doing this, there was a new administrative order that governs um, these proceedings. Um, it's FLMB-2017. Um, and it sets forth everything that we need to be doing and all of the orders that are signed by the judges when you're ordered to mediation uh, for mortgage modification have the exact same language as that uh, new administrative order. That is the third administrative order that's been signed. It was entered March 9, 2017, and it does prescribe all of the procedures for MMMN bankruptcy. Um, it does note that all cases are available for mortgage modification. Now, just because the bank said so, or the, the court said so, doesn't mean the bank agrees. So uh, feel free to file your motion for mortgage modification on any property that you have, keeping in mind that they may not be in agreement that they're going to modify you or can even consider you for a modification. Um, and it also, the court proceedings say it's available for any real property. The highlights of um, FM, FLMB 2017-1 is that remember that the lenders can seek re reconsideration of that order once it's entered. The time frame is small and one of the things I heard from lenders counsel is that they don't even get notification um, that, that the order has been entered in many instances until that deadline has passed. So I'm not so sure how that's working on that side. I'm not involved, but I mean, we have the electronic notification, so I'm not sure that why would, that would be the case. Um, parties have 14 days to select a mediator. Um, I have never been um, rejected as a mediator by either side, so if I'm selected, I mean, they've worked with me and you shouldn't have any problems or hurdles there. Uh, whether they do that in 14 days or not, I don't know, because I don't know it's been entered until it gets uploaded into the portal. The cost of the mediation is shared equally by the parties. Um, the mediator's fees are to be paid seven days after the mediator is selected. Again, I'm going to tell you from my own experience, that never happens. Um, in a lot of instances, I think what's happening on the debtor's side is you get that order that's going to allow you to go to mortgage modification mediation. You tell your client, hey, you need to bring us a check for payment of the mediator fees. The client doesn't come in, doesn't come in, doesn't come in. So you're sitting on that order and not uploading it to the portal yet, and I don't know the order's been entered. So as long as I get paid uh, quickly after everything's uploaded and I'm starting to work in that file, I'm fine with that, and I'm sure others are too. Uh, the fees that are paid to the mediator cover up to two one-hour sessions, but it also pays us for all that time in the portal. They're non-refundable because whether you mediate or not at the end of the day, we've still done our job and the courts determined that we've earned our fee and that uh, we keep it. Um, and we do report if you do settle before you get to the mediation day and you know that may be 61 days in the portal, 70 days in the portal with me monitoring and communicating with you all, um, I will file a final report. They now have a um, thing on your automatic filing a system that allows us to file and say there was no mediation conducted because the parties have reached agreement. If there's been a denial, um, I typically will not, if it's up to the borrower, if the borrower wants to have a mediation yet and ask questions, I strongly recommend they do so because sometimes we can find that figures were used in the calculations that aren't accurate and sometimes the servicer is willing to just uh, correct their errors and redo it, or they'll tell you, submit an appeal. But that's all things we can talk about at mediation. Um, does provide that, as I said, all written communications must be in the portal. Adequate protection payments are paid to the trustee. The modified payments are made through the plan. And um, the mediation is com concluded upon my filing of a report or by order of the court, whichever happens first. Um, 
For the miscellaneous matters, if you are going to be doing these or if you already do them, whether you are debtor's counsel or servicer's counsel, you need to register with the portal administrator and get yourself set up. Uh, the mediator is paid by the firms and not by the parties. I did have a case, uh, two cases in the last, I don't know, two months where I was told the party was sending me a check. And um, while I greatly appreciate that, it, um, it's your job to collect from your clients. I'll take your firm check. I did have one check bounce, so I don't want to be the one who takes that risk. Um, MMM is voluntary, I've told you that. And MMM is not like other mediations. Has anybody in here done a mortgage modification mediation through the portal system? Okay, well you understand that when you're going to a regular mediation and you think you're going to negotiate, that's really not what's going to happen. The lender has a program and it's our job or your job to fit the borrower into that. So because they're not going to be flexible on what their path is to a modification, it's this. And the question is, what can we do with the borrower to get the borrower to fit that so that the borrower is modified? So um, those are the kinds of questions when you go into an MMM, if you want to have a successful result, these are the things you have to think about. Sometimes the lender, the servicer will tell you what you need to do and sometimes they won't. Sometimes they'll tell you how far off she was. But again, we're dealing with new people now and sometimes I don't think they know. I think the underwriter plugged the numbers in and the underwriter says you don't qualify and then the rep comes on the phone and they don't even know anything that the underwriter looked at and they just say, well, we're here to tell you you were denied, um, which is frustrating, but it happens. Um, all portal communications are confidential. And um, for additional authority, if you're doing this kind of work, the things that you should know is that Rule 90, 19-2 governs ADR and bankruptcy. There's local rules and administrative rules that you, and administrative orders that you have to take a look at, regardless of what jurisdiction you're in. Americans with Disability Act applies. Uh, in many instances now, the, of course, the servicer and servicer's counsel is appearing telephonically, but the telephones have to be appropriate to comply with the ADA too for people with, who are hard of hearing. Um, Florida Statutes 44-401 to 44-406 is the Mediation Confidentiality and Privilege Act that applies. Uh, rules for certified and court-appointed mediators apply, which is Rule 10.100 through 10.900 um, and if you're ever confronted with a situation where you're unhappy with a mediator that you have and you think they might have violated a rule or their ethics or done something incorrect that would be a good place to look to check to see if there's anything that you see there um, and as of course the mediator ethic advisory committee the MEAX apply as do the Florida bar which again imposes the same rules on attorneys as they do on attorney mediators so um, that's basically all I had to cover for today. Does anybody have any questions that they want to ask or go ahead? Uh, if, if there's no negotiation on the uh, lender's part and they basically keep their guidelines secret and they just basically can say you're denied either by letter or the person on the phone could say you're denied and I, I'm not telling you why other than you didn't meet our guidelines, isn't that a breach of the good faith requirement? Well, here we go into the land of good faith. Well, I would say two things. Um, number one, um, if it's any issues of good faith that a lawyer wants to raise when you're a litigator, it is your obligation to raise. And there is a sticky wicket out there. There's some case law, and I didn't bring the citations, but uh, where a lawyer contended that a, another lawyer acted in bad faith, and that was um, the whole crux of this whole body of case law that came out um, because the mediator had reported what she was able to require by law, report by law, which was no agreement, or it was terminated, whatever she reported. And when the court was listening to the lawyer who said, hey, the other side acted in bad faith, the court relied on the report of the mediator and said, hey, she didn't report that. So, you, you know, we can't go by your word. We're going to go by what the mediator said. But then all of the, the mediator ethics people got involved and said, she can report that to you. That's an ethics violation. That's against the law. She's prohibited by Florida statutes. And it became this big issue. And that's why all of a sudden we started to see case law that said they, were, they had to, to uh, act in good faith, right? But then it's all been undone because they said, look, a mediator can't, is not the reporter of that. 
A judge is the judge of that, and that can be complained about by the lawyer, but it cannot be brought to the attention of the mediator, and if that's an instance where a mediator has to come in and take the stand and provide testimony under oath, that might be um, a place, but it would be, again, an objective standard. Also, when they give you the denial, it's going to be in a writing form, so it would be something, if you think that that's a violation of ethics, it's something that you probably could attach and send to the court. Um, the denial letters are supposed to give you some details, but we're not in the land of HAMP anymore. HAMP is gone. And so, is it good faith to just say you're denied? I don't know. It seems worthy of a conversation, though, at a mediation, if they deny you, to try to ferret out why. And what the borrowers have to understand is that everything on that they fill out on those forms, I guess you all know because same in the petitions, it has to add up. It's not like you're going to throw numbers on a page and your RMA says you have income of X, but then your tax returns show something different and then your bank account shows something even different from that. Everything has to add up. And, um, and I think if there are questions or concerns about whether or not somebody's acting in good faith, again, it's going to fall on you all to ferret that out because it's not an issue for the mediator. Do I think that it's an issue of bad faith? I don't think it's an issue necessarily of bad faith, but is there a mandate out there that says they must disclose to you or give you some better indication about why they were um, denied? I don't know. I, I'm sure that there's a lot of case law battling that. I don't know how far you get on it if they claim it's uh, proprietary protected trade secret. I don't know. I'm sorry, I didn't answer that very well. <laughs> well, isn't it... Um, well, go ahead. Isn't it the whole definition of mediation is a negotiation? It is, an, uh, well, I, I say that it isn't, not necessarily. I think it is an opportunity for parties to voluntarily participate in a facilitated discussion in an effort to seek a, a negotiated settlement, so to speak, because that's the best word. But it, it, and to even, I think, going back to what we were doing in the state court cases, which it served a purpose. The purpose was to, to do case management. It did not serve the borrowers, and it didn't serve the servicers either. But um, I think at the end of the day, um, it's never been a mediation. It's, we should have never used the word mediation because lawyers who sit down in a mediation have been trained as to what a mediation is and you expect that you're going to negotiate, right? That's what you're going to do. And we're going to caucus and you're going to go back and forth. So this, is, this was really a facilitated exchange of information to determine whether or not a borrower qualifies for a modification. And however you want to call it, call it that. But I always thought, I don't like using the word mediation, but they're also using mediators to facilitate. So I don't know if that was a good answer. <laughs> Go ahead. I've been to that so many times. I have yet to find a single negotiation which I felt the thing negotiating good faith, or you mediate good faith, uh, they, uh, they, you know, they really aren't dealing at all. Also, I think the same situation, I was, I was uh, trying to send five, six, seven packages to get the thing, and, they, and then they uh, lose them, or I was considering them, and they wouldn't tell us what was wrong with it. And then finally, I'd have clients to get in the program, and they put them down, oh, we got a successor to the program, and they make all the payments for six months, do everything, I even tell them, make sure you make all the payments at least five or six days ahead of time. We got approved all that, and at the end they would, they would not get approved for the permanent uh, situation. Well, I hope that that, and that's everybody's experience, and believe me, the borrowers that we have now, some of them haven't paid their mortgages since 2007, 2008, and, but they've been through it too. And believe me, we all have, so we're all in a very, very big boat. We're not sitting out there alone on some island only having this unique experience, but let me assure you that it's very different here. We don't have those problems. But we are, like I say, in a land now where new people are involved in the process and I don't know how well they've been trained and I don't know how much they really want to modify. Uh, but we're in a bankruptcy context. If you're dealing with a Chapter 13 and you can convert to a Chapter 7 and you're looking at modifying a first and a second mortgage, the banks seem to have an incentive to sit and talk to you and to try to work with you. Um, but again, 
the smaller the, the smaller banks that come in now, they behave differently. The communications that we have in the portal are not what we were having, which were so successful. And I think it's going to take a little bit of dragging them along, a little bit of education, a little bit of nudging, um, fortitude, and just to see if we can continue modifying. The servicers and the banks have all told me, I have not had a single one telling me that we're not going to modify post HAMP. They're still modifying. The other program that's still available for a year is the HARP, which is the refinance program. But I don't have a lot of experience with that because most of everything we were doing was HAMP. Also, there are special requirements for veterans. So if you have somebody with a veteran mortgage, um, then you have a different set of circumstances. But it's all worthy of a conversation in this context because you have debt that's going to be wiped away. And the banks, if the, if the uh, borrower is able to pay post-bankruptcy, I would think they'd want to convert a non-performing mortgage into a performing mortgage. So that would be our goal. Anyway, anybody else? So, well, thank you so much for sitting and listening to me. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you. Well, I do want to point out there's two uh, articles that I think you all should take a look at that were in the uh, Florida Bar Journal. Uh, one of them is, it's in the um, March 2017. It's about pro bono services. And Judge McEwen is pleading for pro bono assistance in the bankruptcy courts because people don't know about this program and it is highly successful and she's very proud of it. She was one of the people who pioneered it. And there was also a, um, you know, I don't know what one I pulled this out of, but for you specifically, good faith uh, mediation orders in Florida civil federal courts uh, let the judges do the judging and the mediators do the mediating which was written by Eric Dunlap and Rod Robert Sturgis, and it does talk about some of those tricky cases that were entered. No, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm done. Go ahead. I just wanted to bring any of your books. I did, and I'm so glad you asked. They're holding up the projection, but I have, uh, so I, I have two uh, that pertain to lawyers. Can I pull them out? And yeah, sure. So this is called The Story of Lawyers, and it's all in rhyme, and it has a little glossary in the back for children who are introduced to words that they already knew, but now in a new context. So we teach them about bar and case, words they know, but not in this. So I'll just tell you, it starts, this author's a lawyer, quite proud of it too. You will understand why when you learn what we do. This short little story explains it in rhyme. Please give it a read. It is well worth your time. So it starts off at to start, you should know lawyers all go to school where they study intensely to learn every rule. And then I have all my homage to, you know, my law school, Stetson is on there. <laughs> but anyway, so this is that one. And this one is recommended, I mean, children as small as two or three will love this book if mommy, daddy, grandparents are lawyers, they cherish it. By the time they're six, they can read most of it, but they do hit some big words, litigation is in there. So, um, but they can, can read it pretty much. Do they comprehend it at that age? No, but as they grow, they'll comprehend. And we walk through all different practice areas, which starts with um, prosecutors are lawyers. Uh, I better put this on. Employed by the state. They are often in court and they cannot be late. Representing the people, it's their job to protect. They do this with courage and earn our respect. When prosecutors prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt, criminals go to jail and some never get out. You see? So you could teach children about that. And then, um, at the behest of the judiciary, I came out with the second book, A Story of Lawyers with Views from the Bench, in 2012. And this one incorporates all of the, anybody involved with the education, um, law-related education committee at the Florida Bar, they write the education curriculum for the entire country. And they had a list of uh, requirements that kids needed to know about civics education. And I incorporated almost all of them into this book. So this one is recommended for third grade level to adult. And we learn about judges. And, and they get introduced to words like reverse, remand, recuse, things that we hear about now. Um, but so here we go. Uh, 
and explains the difference between a trial court, an appellate court, and a Supreme Court. And says, oh, when we get to the Supreme, it says, accepted, I'm talking about a case, it goes up, uh, up to the court called Supreme, a place with nine justices highly esteemed up here. There are non, nine, not just three like below. They're the best in the land. That's important to know. The problems these justices work to resolve are the issues that no uh, I'm sorry, that work hard to solve are the issues that no other court can resolve. The cases they handle may just be a few because only those worthy are granted review. And I actually had the Supremes with um, Justice Scalia, so this is a limited edition. There's less than, I think, 400 of these books left. They're sold on Amazon. They're sold uh, in other countries as well, Canada. Um, Australia is a big market. Um, and. Uh, the next printing is not going to have Scalia. So there's just a handful of these left. So anyway, thank you for asking about my books. So and thank you for indulging me in that. Oh. Anyway, any other questions? I think you Are they? <laughs> well, there's more books. There was one called uh, Story of Lawyers Raising the Bar, but it got bumped by a joyful royal debut presenting Prince George. And that one came out and was featured in USA Today when it came out. Um, I have a lot of that book left. Um, a lot of those I'm donating, so if you have a group or organization that you think would like to have some of the Prince George books. And, um, and then I got a, another deal because of the Prince George book. I was hired to do some work, so I appreciate the, the, um, the success it brought me, even though I still have a lot of that book left. It's not selling anymore. Because <laughs> it doesn't have Charlotte and uh, whatever else is to come. So. Anyway, thank you. Anyone else? I think I've probably gone over our time, so thank you. If anybody would like a book, I have them, a few available. Okay. I'm just going to say our next meeting is August 31st, so we'll, I'll send an email on that. Adrian, folks want to mark their calendars. You from the bench is November 1st in Tampa, and November 2nd in Miami. Okay. I'll make sure that I'll make an announcement at the next. Uh, I don't even have a I don't have a